Prior to retiring from full-time employment in 2001, Alan held a number of senior executive positions in, in the oil industry in Australia and overseas, and the local coal industry in the Hill Valley. Alan, who has also served on a number of government, has also served on a number of government and industry committees, in particular an industry representative on the Federal Government's Ecologically Sustainable Development Task Force in 1990. Alan holds an honours degree in chemical engineering from the University of New South Wales. Welcome, Alan. similar to the ones that you are facing here. Uh, I'm going to go back to first principles a little bit. I understand why Tom really focused his presentation on the local area, but I'd, I'd rather go back and, and uh, go back to the start and just have a look at the industry in itself. And this first chart that you see here shows uh, the area in orange, which are the major coal basins in Australia. There's more than that, but those are the ones that are significant at the moment, and those are the ones that uh, coal seam uh, miners are in fact uh, targeting at the present time. And of course, we're right down here in Sydney, right at the very end of the Sydney uh, coal basin. What is coal seam gas? Well, it's a, it, it, it occurs naturally in underground coal seams. It's generally productive between 200 and 1,000 metres below the Earth's surface. Gas is held in fractures in the coal, leaks as they're called, by water pressure and ground pressure. And the gas is released by drilling into the seam, pumping out the water. Uh, most of the wells that uh, are uh, in Australia at the moment, I think there's about 3,500 of them at the moment, are in fact what they call vertical wells, just drilled straight into the ground. There are some uh, wells that have been done more recently that are horizontal, you go down and then you go across. Uh, but there's only about 20 of those that I'm aware of. There's some other techniques that are being talked about, but I don't know of any examples at the present time. Now, CSG is distinguished by its very nature in that it's a very dilute source of energy, uh, in the sense that large areas of land are, uh, have to be uh, used for its extraction. Uh, just to give you an example, and I, I, I couldn't quite relate to Tom's uh, case, uh, of the amount of gas from a well and the thousands of tonnes of coal. But uh, if you take a tonne of coal in a coal seam, uh, you get about uh, 60 times more energy out of that tonne than you do out of uh, uh, the, the gas that comes out of the equivalent amount of coal. So it's a very dilute form of energy. It requires a, a lot of ground. And when you look at the coal mining that's gone on around here and up in the Hunter Valley, uh, what you find there is that the amount of land that's being used, while some people don't like the way that it's being used, the amount of land is relatively small. Whereas here uh, and throughout Queensland, we're talking about uh, the coal seam gas companies probably owning a little bit of land, but they have their major facilities, and the rest of the land that they need, they, they borrow or, or lease from, from the rest of us. This is uh, just a pictorial representation. The well goes down, the gas and the water come out, and they're separated, the water goes to a treatment plant, the gas goes to a processing plant. And this just shows that uh, in the early days of, uh, of the well's life, uh, the main product is actually water. Uh, some of the uh, water uh, uh, in, in, that comes out of the wells in this area is a lot less than up in Queensland, but water comes out nonetheless. And over time, the gas production increases to a maximum, and then it slides down. Now, a lot of infrastructure is required in, in, a, in a gas field. You need access roads, you need, need the wells themselves, you need a series of underground pipelines for water and for gas, you need a major pipeline so you can get the gas, uh, once it's pressurised, into the main system or goes to a power station or whatever. Uh, in selected locations, you'll need water storage facilities. Uh, in Queensland, that's been a very controversial subject because they've used evaporation ponds to handle the water and uh, the water's saline, typically, and, and so you get salts and traces of heavy metals and a few other things uh, uh, that have to be dealt with after that. Uh, and there will have to be water treatment uh, facilities here, too, if the project goes ahead. 
and you need site offices, gas processing facilities, and so on. It's not a small industry. This is a major industry. We're talking in Australia in the next uh, 10 years or so, probably 30 to 40 billion dollars if all the projects get, that they're talking about go ahead, uh, having to be spent. <coughs> The people who do the drilling have to be accommodated somehow. That may not be a problem here, but uh, it, it has been in some other areas. So CSG is a full-scale industrial operation. A lot of heavy vehicle movements are involved, and there's a lot of surface disruption. This is the, the Kenya gas field near the Tara Rural Residential Estate. That's near Chinchilla in South Central Queensland. And it shows what a gas field looks like when all the roads are in place. And, uh, and the wells are in operation. Over time, these will be rehabilitated, but for a period of time, probably five, six, seven years, I'm not sure, this, uh, this is what it, it will look like. So we've got some wonderful landscape areas around the Southern Highlands and the Illawarra, and a lot of people are very concerned about this type of development. These wells, I understand, are 700 metres apart, uh, some companies like to go to 400 metres in some circumstances, so you could get more intense development. And uh, other companies uh, in, in different areas uh, might have one and a half kilometres between the wells. But nonetheless, this is the basic uh, outlook that we, we could see. The communities are, are divided on the merits of CSG. Obviously, state and federal governments are in favour of it because they see economic growth, income tax, royalties and so on flowing their way. Large landowners in marginal areas and uh, communities in those areas are generally supported. Uh, there, there is uh, a significant income to large landholders. You might have a, a farmer on marginal land earning 100,000, 200,000 a year uh, of extra income, far more than he could get from the use of his uh, property for agricultural purposes. And in, in certainly in areas of Queensland in particular, some of the outback Towns, or lots of outback towns that have been in decline for years are seeing a, a, a revival period of time. The mayors are happy and uh, everybody's running around, uh, the schools are full of kids again and so on. So there, there, there is a lot of benefit and there's a lot of support in those areas for coal seam gas. Uh, Gladstone has always been a bit of a boom town but at the moment it's really going through the roof with uh, so supposedly eight LNG trains which are, are huge investments their own, being constructed almost simultaneously. Uh, uh, the chances of that happening, I think, are fairly remote, but that's what people are talking about at the present time. The people that are against coal seam gas uh, bas basically fall into the following camps. Uh, people with a concern for the environment, there may be people in this room who, who believe that uh, under no circumstances should we, we, we mine coal seam gas because it's a fossil fuel, and, and that alone. But if you put that aside, other, other people are uh, very concerned as well. And you've heard a lot in the last month or so from the farmers uh, on the Darling Downs and around the Narrabri area, farmers with very productive land who feel that the use of coal seam gas, the roads in and so on, uh, are, are likely to uh, affect the uh, productivity of their land and perhaps cause them problems in the long term in, in the water, with the water that they need. And of course, uh, and this is more appropriate for here, uh, small landowners, uh, uh, land with special scenic value or for specialised uses, you know, people who've got five acres, ten acres, even up to a hundred acres, uh, hobby farms and so forth, vineyards, olive groves and, and so on, they're very concerned that this industry will take away from their scenic value and for reasons that I'll mention in a moment, uh, cause difficulties with the possible sale of the land. You know, where, where a farmer who owns 100,000 acres may keep that property in his, his family for, for the duration. People around here who own five acres, 10 acres and so on probably are only going to own it for six or seven years. And yet here we have an industry that could control the use of that land for, uh, for 20 or 30 years. The main concerns that we have, and Tom has mentioned that nobody's very concerned with aquifers down here, but generally through the community, yeah, in the area where I live, the Southern Highlands, uh, up in, uh, around the Liverpool Plains, the Darling Downs, uh, the contamination and damage to aquifers is a major concern. Uh, the industry went through a period of denial where they said that it 
it's all under control and everything will be all right. But we've had a number of instances in recent times where there has been uh, contamination. Up in, the, up in the Southern Highlands, I can tell you that the coal seam that the planet gas wanted to tap up there uh, sits right under the Hawkesbury sandstone, which is the major uh, carrier of the aquifers in that particular area. And there is, uncertain, it is without doubt, there will be uh, contamination and, and, and dewatering of the major agricultural aquifers that we have in that area and in many other parts of Australia. I've spoken about the impairment of high quality agricultural land. Uh, there's an issue with visual and lifestyle impacts. And, and in particular, the, you know, the agreement that you will have, with, we will have with the companies that are going to uh, be producing the gas on our land, uh, in fact, in, encumber the title of the land. They go with the land themselves. So if you want to sell it on, the person who buys it from you has to be prepared to take up that, uh, that particular uh, encumberment and my own view is, having had a little bit of experience with real estate, is it's likely to reduce, almost certainly going to reduce land values in these sorts of situations. I, I've covered a lot of these areas already so I'll just go through them quickly. Uh, large landowners see CSG as a major attraction. Uh, and residents of nearby towns are also supported. Farmers with agricultural uh, quality land don't share the enthusiasm of their grazier colleagues uh, because they're worried about the impairment of the land, the productivity and concern about the damage to aquifers. Small landowners, as I've explained, are, are feel that uh, CSG is a major threat to them and the, and the beauty of, of their properties. And, you know, we're talking about uh, land on the coast here uh, that might be uh, uh, you know, ten thousand uh, dollars an acre. Uh, you're talking about land up in the Surat Basin that might be, uh, you know, just uh, you know, five hundred dollars an acre or something like that. Hydraulic fracturing. I won't go over in a great deal of detail. It's certainly been around for a long time. I think it was invented by Amico in the late 1940s, early 50s, uh, for use in the oil and gas industry. But there is a difference between the use of fra uh, fracking in the uh, oil and gas industry where it's a great depth and they're going into uh, sandstone strata that are uh, hundreds of metres uh, thick uh, compared with CSG. And the closer you get to the surface, the more worried I would be about, about fracking. Uh, problems have been reported in, in the US in uh, some CSG mines and shale gas mines uh, and that, that fear comes over here and I think it's incumbent on the companies to assure us that it's all going to be all right. Uh, some companies have already made some concessions. Uh, one, I think Origin Energy won't frack at less than 300 metres and, uh, and there's great transparencies and so on. Tom has said that they're, they're not going to frack in this area and that's great. That is really great. But the thing that worries me is when I look at a company the size of Tom's company, and I look at Apex Energy, the size of Apex Energy, I don't think that we are actually dealing with the people who are actually going to produce the gas from the field when we talk to Tom at the moment. He, he will give us an assurance, no doubt, about, about the exploration, and I accept his assurance on that. But I am worried, and I think all you should be worried, about who comes next, and whether they think fracking is a good thing or a bad thing. So while we can put it aside, as far as the community is concerned, I would be encouraging you to keep a very, very close eye on it because it could come our way. And I've only got one more slide. Uh, two more slides. <laughs> I'll, I'll leave Kirsty to talk about the CSG legislation. But the other great worry for all of us is that the legislation that governs this industry get, dates back to 1991, the Petroleum Onshore Act, which doesn't even mention CSG. The sorts of issues that we have with the, C, the nature of CSG are not covered by any legislation at the present time, and that has to change, it really does. And so, I think I've discussed all of these issues. But a summary, just one summary slide. So the CSG industry offers an economic opportunity in some areas, but in my opinion it's being developed in unnecessary haste in closely settled communities and those involving high quality agricultural <coughs> land. We don't need the gas now. There's no need for it to go ahead right now. 
the, the, the techn technology can be sorted out. There is no pressing need to do it. Certain sections of the community, and, and the particularly closely settled areas like this one, will be detrimentally affected. And, and there are significant environmental risks that I'm sure other people will talk about later. The legislative framework is inadequate. Uh, and if the legitimate concerns that the community have, certainly I'm speaking for people in my area, uh, on the preservation of high value cropping land, the impact on the landscape and landowners, if these issues are not resolved, then landowners will continue to resist granting land access. And they have to do it now. It's too late when the exploration has taken place and they're ready to go into production because there's no way that the government will stop it at that stage. And the Minister for Energy said as much uh, the other day. We need to know the full size of the project before we agree to allowing the exploration stage to go ahead. And I have this quote that was burned in my mind from the Helensburg meeting that we had a little while ago uh, from Mike Bullen, who's the general manager of the uh, Central <coughs> Catchment Authority. He said, you don't let the elephant into the room when you only know the size of his trunk. We need to see the full scope of these projects before we allow the exploration to go ahead. Thank you.